Wow. There you go. Two quality guests. Jamie, how'd you manage that, man? Well, we have more coming, too. What? I don't know about and, uh, <laughs> Come but, on. Okay, who, yeah. I mean, you guys. Who who thought it was hard to get Bobby West on his show? All you gotta do is ask. He'll be there. Uh, I turned down that one show to have you on. Remember, I said no. You talked to Adam. He knows more about the hash bash than I do. So you talked. There you Adam. go. I turned. I turned shows down. <laughs> <laughs> well, we ne- we may not have the best or the prettiest. <coughs> or the brightest here, but we have the best guests for the uh, for the situation. That's for sure. And it's four twenty, everyone. And it's four twenty. Four twenty. Yeah. It's a pretty tough introduction. They're not the best, or the brightest, or the prettiest. But covering all the ground. Yourself, Jamie. Wow. Covering all the covering all the ground. Sorry. Carol's pretty cute. Come on now. Look at that. Uh, Must be watching soccer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, I'm here. How's it going? Bobby, kind of a tough week, huh? You know? Uh, yeah, very hard, you know, with uh, George, Boston George, George Young, you know, George, George Jacob Young passed on the uh, fifth last week. But it's been a little little rough week for all his friends that, that knew him and loved him. And there was a lot of them. A lot of people knew him, but not too many people really knew him as well as some of the people on the show today. Spent a lot of time with him. We were blessed to spend a lot of time with George. You know, I met him back in 2016 when I first met him. A guy named Marsh asked me if I wanted to interview him. Of course, I jumped at the chance. You know, from that, you know, he uh, called me up a few days later. I gave him my card and never thought I'd ever hear from him. I get a call, and usually I don't answer if I don't recognize it, but I'm like, Tom told me to answer the phone. So I answer it, and he goes, hello, Bobby West, <laughs> Uncle Stoner. I'm like, uh, yeah, this is George. Boss is George. I'm like, oh, shit. How you doing, sir? I'm doing good. Yeah, I just want to tell you, I loved how you interviewed me. You really put me at ease. You didn't try and jam me up. That, well, fucking governor won't let me smoke cannabis. Well, he actually said marijuana. Marijuana. And uh, so... I'm drinking scotch, so we'll call this Scotch Talks. And so we started talking. Uh, you know, we talked sometimes twice a day, you know, for more for a long time. And then I happened to help him out, get out there, get him out. And he had problems with his uh, people that he's were, were working with, his one team. He asked me to help him out, get him back out there in the cannabis scene, you know, shows and stuff. And then, so I started doing that. I was blessed for the time and everything that we got to spend together. All right, Daryl's back. We switch seats. Okay, you want to? Well, I know that there's a there is a a long history that concerns George, and uh, very involved. And many people are familiar with the movie, you know, and Blow and uh, Johnny Depp plays his character and and that type of stuff. But uh, you know, from the time he was out and trying to assimilate and stuff like that, that's kind of the, uh, when you cross paths with them, isn't it, Bobby? And then ultimately, I know that you introduced him to Daryl, and he ended up spending a lot of time with us out here. And you know, and, you know yeah, this is where he's first, touched. Yeah, my first lead to George was actually a tad bit prior to Bobby, but Bobby's the one that brought him here. We actually tried to get George to come to John Sinclair's 75th birthday that we had here, birthday bash, which obviously Adam was there, a bunch of you guys were here. So we were trying to get George to come, but he was just out and he was on probation. And couldn't leave the state. <coughs> and then, surely enough, later that year, Bobby comes up to us and, and kind of brings him out eventually. It says, hey, we can get him out there. And then once we met him, we just clicked. Once Bobby brought him out here, uh, George and I just clicked really good. And it was I remember the spur of the moment, he called me one time and he, he starts thanking me for allowing him to come live at my house. And I had no clue by this time. <laughs> But Melissa actually invited him in to, to stay at the house. So George is telling me, hey, yeah, we're going to be there in a week. We appreciate you like coming to live with us. And I'm like, yeah, okay, okay. And then I hang up the phone and, Melissa, did you invite Boston George to come live with us? She's like, yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of, but he stayed here for what, you know, six, months? six months, you know, in my house, the other place we put him in. Well, we have John Schlicker on the, on the chat here, too, and I know that uh, Boston George made an appearance up at Canapalooza. 
Um, he, you know, he really got around while he was here in town, made the most of his time and touched a lot of lives. Wouldn't you say that? Oh, God, yes. You know, that's one thing. Every show, people were coming up to it. I, one thing I noticed, guys, looking back through a lot of footage, because I got footage and photos going back all the way to 2016. The ladies loved him. I mean, the young ladies, oh, my God, all the videos, photos he took with him. I mean, women loved him. I mean, it, something about that uh, gangster smuggler. You know, outlaw feel that they just flocked to him at all the shows. You know? And actually, that Cannapalooza event, when we took George up to that, uh, that was when he actually had some good quality time with John Sinclair. So one of the pictures I posted in my Facebook was at the Cannapalooza event with George and John. You know, you see George holding John's hand, and they're actually having deep conversation. And uh, it was a good connection for those two at that point. Because they met at Hashback. Yeah, I introduced him, actually. I have the Hashback. video, actually. But John was in his own little world. And, uh, and George is not feeling well. He had sniffles. Oh, yeah, oh there's yeah. Well, actually, that picture there, that's when, uh, that was a Cow Palace, I think, 2016. That was when he was still with the other productions. And that is his daughter, uh, Christina. Uh, Christina and Sunshine Young. And I was able to, on stage that day, be the first one to say, George has his heart back. Because, you know, in the movie, at the end of the movie, he says, you know, he just wish he had his heart back, which was his daughter. You know, so that was really nice times, you know, back then. Really beautiful times, you know, meeting him. Never in a million years thought I'd ever become close friends with someone like that. You know, especially watching the movie when it came out and then finally meeting him. And everything. He, you know, the stories he had, had were amazing. And he's a brilliant man. Quick thinker, always ready. I mean... Really brilliant. Too. Yeah, and he, his mind was there all the way to the end. Like Bobby and I, you know, we talked to him uh, once, like a week before, and he was still sharp. You could hear him, and he was sharp on the phone. Then the day before he passed, we had him on FaceTime. He was canatonic. You could see him. His eyes were closed. He was laying in bed. But we were talking to him, and, and he, his mouth was moving, but nothing was coming out. And I swear I saw a mouth fuck you. <laughs> I he, he probably did. <laughs> He mouthed to us. The last word that he said was, fuck you. <laughs> yeah. No, I With, love. Actually, yeah. With love. With love. 100%. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. yeah, it was great seeing you. Know, I was like, uh, a few days before we came back here, Rhonda reached out to me, and I got to call him and talk to him a little bit and see him. You know, you know and him and Rhonda were, were together. You know, she wrote to him for 14 years. She actually... Supposed to be on the show. I'm not sure if she's going to, but today is also the day she was picking up George's ashes. So I can imagine it's a pretty rough day for her. So if she doesn't come on the show, that's because, you know, you know she's dealing with it. She's been, you know, she wrote him for 14 years in prison. And then when she got out, so she, she's been communicating with this guy for over 21, you know, 21 years. So, so I mean, all together. And so it's been kind of rough for her, you know. I would say uh, one of the things um, some of the people mentioned, George was always willing to take a photo. One of the neatest things that I noticed once George passed away was the social media bla uh, explosion of photographs with individuals with their arm out around George. And everybody has a photo with their arm around George. He, he loved he loved that, and he loved that people were willing to uh, take their photo, you know, take a photo with them, and, and uh, um, you know, he, he loved well, I being- I have to say, one of, my favorite photo, one of my favorite photos is George holding Adam Brooks' hand. And Listen, I don't know if you can find that one, but that's a great, great picture. That, that photo is more like a video. George held my hand for four, at least 45 minutes. <laughs> and, and, you know, I've, I've been involved in a lot of relationships, but that one was unique. I mean, I, I, uh, I mean, it was like a love fest with this man holding my hand, carrying on conversations with people in the room that had nothing to do with the fact that he was holding my hand. <laughs> you know, if George well, touched you, it's one thing. Him. If he held your hand, that's something different. Yeah, if he loved you, he held your hand. You know, and I got, you know, yeah. There's a few interviews out there with me, and he's just holding, you know, holding my hand as we're doing the interview. You know, he, he was a very passionate man, and he, the people that truly had his back, he cared about, you know. 
came up and gave some autographs to our people at the at the botanical company in East Tawas. Two. Yeah. And of course, Adam, remember, you know, he hasn't had sex with a woman in 25 years. Yeah, yeah, I have I, I have George recorded saying one of the all time greatest quotes of all time. I mean, this is I'm considering selling this as an NFT. It's so great. But George was talking and, and uh, you know, he, he was talking. We were sitting out on the porch one night and he's talking and he says, you know, they, they took away the, the best years of my life. He says I, I was locked up. He says. I didn't have sex with a woman for 20 years. And Chris, with a woman. Yes, that, I, I did. It hits, you, that with hits a woman. you after he says it, you know? But. Oh, yeah. I love that photo George, there. My man. wife took that photo there. My wife took that photo and we had a, another guy to color it in and all. And then we gave that to George who uh, saw it. Uh, Perfect. This guy's ducked out for a second. But this particular one, Bobby was just saying that his, his wife took this original picture and helped to create this thing for George and he does signatures and stuff like yeah. that. He's just nice. So this one, though, my friend Donnie was getting married up north. This George was up there at East Tawas, which is right near the place where he was getting married. And uh, I couldn't make it to the wedding. And I asked him to just write a note to him. Then I got to him later on. And that's what that uh, bless your union is up there. It was just you know very cool, dude. George that was that kind of guy. All you had to do was ask. He was happy to yeah. do any type of request and uh, write anything you wanted. And you know, he was a hell of a guy. And he'd tell you anything, man. I mean, people would ask him questions, and 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 you know, where's the money? Well, there was no money left. Um, uh, uh, and 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 people thought like. You know, well, what was Pablo like? Well, they were drug smugglers, these guys. What do you mean, what was he like? I mean, he had great stories. He told you, in the movie, you see it, where when he met Pablo, he killed the guy, you know, right there. I mean, he once he once told uh, Melissa, our friend, that he was never afraid of Pablo Escobar, but he's scared of Melissa. I mean, these guys were... Uh, they were classics. They were, and they were from a different generation. That George was. Uh, if you've met other smugglers like Bobby Platshorn and 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 those guys, they're all the same, but different. But they all come from the same mold, kind of like, or the same factory. Um, that's and he was just a classic. That's swagger. Yeah, I mean, I asked him once. All right, George, what's the best way to dispose of a body? <laughs> water is the answer. We're waiting. Answer. He answered, though. Water. Toss the body out the plane. But George was a hell of a guy. And I, I traveled with him, went to Kansas City, and just to see the respect that people everywhere, everywhere he went, they, 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 uh, you know, gave him a great, a great amount of respect. And, uh, I would say that most of it is because of the performance of Johnny Depp and the movie blow, because 90% of the people would have no clue who Boston George was. Mind you, he was number 17 on the world's, uh, richest drug smugglers. Um, so he, you know, he's well known in, in the society. But uh, for the masses to know who this man was, like they did, it was all about that movie. You know, part of the discussion with him about the movie is that he'll say that he'll agree that they got it right, that they consulted with him a lot on it. And he was able to get out of prison sometimes for like a day to go consult on it or something like that. I don't, I don't know the, the exact story, but or they would come in and hang out with them or something, and, and it would be like a nice break for him. It, it was factually correct. Well, that Right. That and for the most part. Book, well, when the book came out, you know, Bruce, before the book came out, Bruce Porter followed him around in the 90s, all that, and to make it sure that it was really happening, you know, that, that <coughs> the man was, was true. 
and, and everything. So and that was pretty interesting. The fact that he actually had why he was still doing his smuggling. He had a, he 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 had this guy follow him around to you know to write this book and help him write the you know rewrite the book. Uh, you know, it was, uh, I think it was uh, grazing on the grass till the uh, snow fell. Is what it was first out of back before it came blow. So, yeah, but George has always been a, you know he's an outlaw and he lived outlaw life and people love that. People love that about someone that lived it and. And he was still alive and was could share them stories. You know, a lot of people want to be like that, you know. They see things in the movies and they want to be like that. And here this man made a, they made a movie app of him. So, but yeah, like, uh, like um, Adam said, no one really would have known unless that movie, unless he wouldn't have wrote that first, that first uh, book. Uh, you know, no one would have known. He would have just been another smuggler smuggler out there but once Johnny you know they got that made into a movie you know everybody knew Boston George and there is a second book now too high on tuna yeah it just came out a couple months ago uh yeah he sent me a copy of it which I have a copy of high on tuna and, you, know, nice and you have you have to understand that George's mind he George was whack his book's great <laughs> because it, it you know, when they take a book and turn it into a movie, they add a bunch of stuff. They fill in the bits and pieces. His writing style is out of this world. He's he's a, a he's marker. Yeah, yeah. He, no, he, he's he's just his style was out of this world and and curt and to the point. And he was a he was not a bullshitter, and he didn't have to make anything up because the stories were true. You know, real life was all he needed to talk about. Yeah. That most of the time he wrote it with big markers, the big markers, the black markers. That's how he did it, on a plain piece of paper and wrote it with a big marker. That's usually how he wrote out his stories. You know, back then. Big Sharpie on on legal uh, pad. Yeah. Big but yeah, you know, so he touched a lot of lives, and I, I'm sure you know that. They have a docu series coming out. I'm sure it's gonna come out now because the day that he passed away, I mean, that was all you, you type in his name on search, and that's tons of stuff to come out all about him and stuff. I mean, it was all over social media and stuff. So the, I'm sure the docu series will come out. Get people get to know him a little bit better. You know? Yeah, George would have been proud. He finally made TMZ. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And so uh, that time, that. Go ahead, Bobby. Oh, no, I said because the first time it was just a quick blurt, blurt when he got out of prison, and then when we went and out and when he went back in for jail, he went back to jail for six months. They did quick blurt on him. This I think is the longest piece they've done on him. You know, it was and that, that and that was when the um, there was a crew that was following around at Hash Bash, right? A years yes. was a part of that. So yeah. when when he came to Hash Bash, a little birdie told me that they tried to get him a speaking spot and they were denied. And, yeah, yeah. and, uh, okay, whatever. The people that run hash bash didn't want one of the, you know, best well-known cocaine smugglers speaking. I understand that, but I took it upon myself to give up my speaking spot. And when I was introduced, I introduced George and just handed him the microphone. And, um, to have a guy like Boston George speak to a, the next generation to me was huge because I knew that he started smuggling weed. I knew that Boston George was a weed smuggler and it was only because of the economy of scale that he switched over to cocaine. And yeah, he smuggled you know, cannabis for 15 years. A lot of people don't realize he smuggled cannabis for 15 years, you know, you know, he went to good. prison for cannabis. And it was too. actually cannabis that he went to prison for. Right, right, right. When that. he met Carlos later oh, it was, in it, prison, it was, that was yeah. that was a weed charge that he was in. I actually have a photo. He showed me the original police record. You know, I remember when I was staying at his house in uh, it was Sacramento, San Diego. He had the original police record there, and I, my wife and I saw it, and she took a photo of it. But, yeah, you know, it was, you know, it was all, all for cannabis. And of course, right. the people that busted him, chased him around all these years, they came to his birthday party and premiere 
premiere teaser of his docu series uh, two years ago. So yeah, yeah, and Bruce Porter came, and then the uh, the other two F X FBI. Agents. All right, so he agent, excuse me. Right, and one of the funny one of the funny side notes to that is that the DEA agent that busted him and that he went to prison on that case is now the police chief of Plymouth, Michigan. Yeah. So yeah. I encourage all of you Boston George fans, if you're ever in Plymouth, Michigan, go to City Hall, ask to see the police chief and shake the man's hand. And that dude busted a, a, one of the originators of this very show, Derek Gauci, from that area. He was busted by that guy a few times. Yeah. Uh, and was and was told about his connection to Boston George. And when Boston George came to our studio at CRB, uh, Derek showed up and was able to meet him and confirm what he was what he's being told about that. Yeah, I think that's awesome. I mean, you know, it just it's it's a small circle. Oh. Yeah. No, when, when we were in Hollywood, when we were in Hollywood at Man's Chinese Theater. You know, this guy comes in. You know, I go, oh, you're the one of the guys, one DA. He's chasing. He goes, yeah, I'm so and so. And he has his card, and I give it to my wife. And my wife looks. She's like, uh oh, he's right, not too far from Daryl's place. <laughs> uh, she got all paranoid all of a sudden. She's like, well, I, that's kind of weird that he, you know. <laughs> I, I did have brunch. I had brunch with him and George together, which was a great brunch we had in Plymouth one time. So I, I at least had a chance to hear the story on the side of the DEA agent, which was great. What a what a great soul you have to be in order to break bread with the man that put you behind bars, right? I mean, well, we brought that up on the, the um, oh, yeah. in the studio with us too. That was that was pretty cool. Like George thought, you know, he, he played a game, they played a game. They just wanted what? You know, they they wanted you know. And, and for George this was a game. Excitement and adventure. He had plenty of money. It was just all about what he could get away with, and you know, and everything. He loved, of course, he loved being able to go anywhere without anybody questioning you. Because when you had a lot of money, no one questioned you. You got open doors. You know. Right. And George loved the game. He 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 wasn't really. He didn't care about the drugs. He didn't care about the smut. He loved the game. He he he. he the stories he would tell, um, about you know the the excitement. Um, I mean, uh, George told me, most people don't know this, that, air, first of all, airplanes don't require keys. And <laughs> airplanes are not locked up. Yeah. So if you think you can fly, or if you can fly, stealing airplanes is easy. Now, he's talking 40, 30 years ago when they didn't have the radar that they have today. Now I assume as soon as you get up in the air, they know where you're at and they follow you. Transponders, um, yeah. Right, transponders and everything, things are very different. But the reality is that's, you know, that was the game back then, knowing that you could just scam an airplane, fly down to Columbia, fill it up full of dope, and bring it back. No, Adam, did he ever tell you the story about the time he landed? As he's getting ready to land, the plane catches on fire, so he lands it on fire, it jumps out as all the fire trucks coming and stuff. He just keeps on walking like he didn't know what was going on. Walks in the building, sees the first flight attendant, and says, "Hey, you going into town?" And she's like, "Yeah, can I get a ride?" Yeah, and boom, clap, boom, you know, off he goes. He said that's how sometimes easy it was, you know. Because I asked him, "What, you know, did you ever get any kind of crazy flights or anything?" And that's one of the stories he told me is, is that one about you know plane catching on right. fire and he just like walking away. Yeah. So I like, I liked, I asked him once, I said, so tell me how the payments went down. I mean, you're, you're, you're going to fly 30 million back, right? And you're going to hand 30 million to Pablo Escobar. Does he hand it to his wife and have her count it or what? He says, no, man, this is exactly how much money weighs. He could tell you how much. A hundred thousand weighed, how much a million weighed, how much five million weighed, and it was all just weighed out like everything else they did. I thought yeah. that was kind of interesting, you know, because if you think about it, he had a house once that had that in the movie they showed it. They showed the house and there's nowhere to put money. There's just there's money everywhere because money was just a tool to make things happen. It wasn't. Nobody was worried about paying their bills. That was for sure. They didn't have bills. Everything was cash. 
prepaid. <laughs> so, now he's had an experience working for him. A dream of it. You know, a lot of people. A lot of people would wish they could live a life like that. Maybe, maybe without doing the illegal stuff, but they still wish they could live a life like he did. You know, I said, he did that so, I mean, oh, he went anywhere, anywhere in Hollywood. He met so many people. He told me a time when he went to this house with a friend of his. This guy opens the door. Of course, you know, he don't watch much TV. He goes, hi, I'm Henry. And I'm Henry, Henry Fonda. So he goes down to the basement with Henry Fonda. Jack Nicholson is there before he even got started, you know, and I forgot who else was there. And they sit there and smoke weed, you know. And this is when they were working on the uh, Easy Rider and all that. You know, like, stories like that, and, you know, things he got to just do, meet other interesting people. In Which starlet yeah. did he claim he banged? Uh, that one, the original Lois Lane, uh, Brandy's, uh, I can't remember. But yeah, that's one of the stories. Actually, I just saw the. Oh, he also video. claimed he also claimed Janis Joplin is one of his. Uh... The original Lois Lane. He played Lois Lane in Superman. I used to sleep with her on bales of uh, uh, cannabis, and a lot of things. I wish I got it on video, but he also talked about he used John Wayne's uh, vehicles, studio vehicles, to transfer cannabis from Mexico over to. Uh, the U.S. and L.A. and stuff. Arpo, yeah, Arpo, big, Arpo, Arpo, big RVs. Arpo uh, Productions. Well, he used to use them back in the day also to get stuff over. I mean, he... He was inventive. He was very inventive. He knew how to do things. No. He met a lot of celebrities. Would not want to piss John Wayne <laughs> off knowing that his, uh, his vehicles were... He might come at you with a six-gun. Yeah. Yeah, Definitely. definitely. You know, George George traveled around the states. I'm sorry, Adam, you were going to say something. I apologize. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say that uh, um, he never did anybody wrong. I never heard anybody talk bad about him. You know, all the people I know. And I mean, all right, I let me take that back. He did Daryl Stravros wrong. Um, he, he got really drunk one night, just one night, at oh. Daryl's house. And um, the only night he ever really got drunk. And, and I don't know exactly how this happened, but somehow George ended up totally naked asleep on the stairs. Um, I don't know how he got naked or why he got naked, but he was naked on the stairs. And um, Daryl had to carry him up to bed naked. And, that, I mean, I don't know how much wrong, more wrong you could do a man. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but other than that, I don't think he ever did anybody wrong. I really don't. He was a good-hearted guy. Yeah, I mean, that's the man I met. That's the man I knew. He had a lot of people take advantage of him because he, he, he wanted to help everybody out. I mean, anybody that had ideal or something like that that involved him, he wanted to do it and stuff. But unfortunately, a lot of people took advantage of him Not you know when he was out, not the other way around. Because he, he just wanted to meet people and talk and tell his stories and, and live some kind of life like he used to have without being an outlaw, you know, and I'm glad I was able, actually able to give that, you know, help him out with that, with bring him here, instantly introduce with, with me giving Adam a call and saying, yo, you know, his production team tried to get him to be able to speak at the Freedom Rally, but they won't want it, but what can you do? Of course, Adam, you know, you did your thing, and next thing I know, they're coming out here, you know, filming him, you know, which is kind of funny, because when they film him, you know, they, they come here first, and they, uh, they want us to go pick George up. So they kept filming me and Daryl talking and all that. And when I get there, I get out. And, you know, there's camera set up. I get out. But then they say, okay, now we want you, Uncle Stoner, we want you to drive back, you know. And, of course, I have seizures in the morning once in a while. But, you know, it's for the camera. And I'm like, but I'm sitting there driving, trying to hold a conversation, you know, I'm being filmed in camera with George and trying to think, thinking to myself, please don't have a seizure. Please don't have a seizure. And he has and, to follow me. And have to follow Daryl. And you know how speedy he is sometimes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm so, we're lost. Somewhere, I'm lost. We're all lost somewhere else. In hell. I can't remember how we got back, but we got back to the house. <laughs> but yeah, that was, that was some fun times. It's a little scary and nervous, so, though. Yeah. You know. But I feel you know, yeah. George George did try to get me to go steal a plane with him one time. Uh, I think he tried to get all of us to do that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's like, just one more time. He was always about just one more time. One more, just one more. Just one more. 
That's all I need. You know, Remember when we had him in studio? We go ahead, Bobby. Sorry. No, no, I was just gonna say I do think it's kind of interesting, somewhat karma, that he died on Cinco de Mayo day. You know how much he loved Mexico, mm -hmm. and, you know, and he actually winded up at ten twenty-two on May fifth, passing away. So it's kind of a I don't know, Sharon deputy or something like that. Mexico is what started him out, you know, becoming a big smuggler and all that. And then he and his goal up. was always to get back to Mexico. Yeah, which he did for a little bit of time. Right. It was too close to the border of San Diego. It was too cold for him, so he came back. And then, yeah, then I think he came you know, here. We asked him uh, what he thought the how successful a wall would be for for keeping out uh, contraband and smugglers and stuff like that. He laughed. I'm sure he laughed. He said, "You know, fly over, fly right over." Fight over walls, right? <laughs> Listen, they just I just read a story the other day. They found 60 bales of weed and their cocaine and stuff in Cali floating up on the shores. Guys are still doing it. They're still flying planes. They're still pushing bales out of planes. Um, you know, they're a dying breed, guys like George, but uh, it's still happening. All the drug war ever did was make, make drugs uh, more accessible and less, and less costly. Uh, I mean, it, it, nothing's. There's a lot that's changed as far as cannabis goes. There's a lot that's changed. But if you think of all the all the H that's consumed in the United States and and the coke and things like that, it's a big market. You can produce meth locally, but the rest of it, I mean, come on. Oh yeah. So. So uh, George had a. Uh, there was some controversy around him. There was uh, the. Uh, discussion slash accusation about how we uh, snitched on somebody and as i think adam was saying you can talk to him about anything and uh, uh i brought it up to him when he was hanging out up in east Tawas, and he said yeah that was that was like done though with the knowledge of like everybody involved that particular dude actually called him up later on to you know to reconnect with them and try to get right. some advice or some help or something like that so that was orchestrated. That's 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 a very common thing that a lot of people don't understand. That I need the the prosecutor needs to get someone to get up and make a statement that they saw or were a party to, and in exchange for whatever, people get up and do that. That's not really snitching. I mean, yeah, he might have testified against the guy in court, but that was organized. That, you know, he was he was proud that he did it. He helped his buddy out. He helped, you know, everybody got helped by each other in that deal. Well, and, and prosecutors yeah, just seem to get everybody, everybody, on the record. Everybody played along. That guy was, would have been yeah, another. It was that way. If everybody played along, that person actually got a better sentence than a worse one. If they all, you know, like yeah. George played along with it, the guy that was getting prosecuted right. knew. Yeah, please do, because he knew he was going to get a lower sentence, because they were all playing together in this, you know. And, and Carlos later, who who that was, that, that that guy was, just got out of prison himself on a, he had a life plus 153 year sentence, and they commuted it after like 30 years, 33 years. And that's the character Diego. In the yeah. Movie. Right, right. And he's now in Germany, I believe, Carlos later. He was a German citizen. He was deported. Yeah, he had dual citizenship between Colombia and, and Germany. And he couldn't go back to Colombia because he feels he'd be dead. So he went right. Back. Oh, and one of the things that I wanted to mention about the movie, because everybody talks about how George says that the movie was accurate. Well, there were things that weren't. One of the things that wasn't accurate, in the movie they tell you that George married a Colombian woman. Yeah. But he didn't. He married a Cuban woman. But you can't talk about Cuba in the movie because then you'd have to explain that George went to Cuba all the time. When you weren't allowed to. Right, when you weren't allowed, right, to. You weren't allowed to. Takes away from the romance. Everybody knows, yes, George worked for the CIA at times, just like Barry Seal did, you know. They gave George guns, he took it to a certain, certain place, and he gave them the guns, they, they either gave him the money so he could coke, or they gave him, you know, coke. He used to, it was just the money, depends on where he's going. They gave him money. But the, he worked for the CIA, too, just like Barry Sill. But people knew that, but they didn't put that in the movie. You know, and it was part of, the, part of that life back then, though, too. 
Hey, so I don't, we, we may or may not, as we discussed earlier in the show, you know, hear from Rhonda and, and some others, but, um, but just a little overview. You you started talking about it, Bobby. Talk about how how they got connected. That's a unique story in and of itself. And well, Rhonda wrote like you know wrote a few different people, you know, a few different celebrities and stuff like that. She was a pen and pen. Well, yeah, pen pal. And she wound up writing George, and he responded, and that response went on for fourteen years. So he'd write her love letters or vice versa. Actually, in the docu series, there's a part they don't cut it out where she has she has pretty much I think uh, she has all the these letters. Read it on George is okay because it was when he got locked up for the six months. So <coughs> so they had to film, and that's what they filmed is her talking about all the wonderful letters. Before. Of course, some of them were pretty erotic, if yeah. you can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> So she was a professional when he got out. That's you know, yeah, but she 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 cared for George, you know, know, especially these last 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 month and stuff. Last few weeks, it was really hard, and she was there by his side almost 24 hours, 24 7. Right, every time I called, she was right there. So, you know, for sure, she and he cared for her. I mean, sometimes it was uh, feeding a fuel fire or fire fuel. But they loved each other, and they did. There was no relationship, and that's he liked that. He liked that, you know, that craziness, that excitement. You know, from the time you connected and were bringing bringing them around different places and stuff, that they were that union was in place, and that and that she came well, with the package, were, right? Of course, because when I first met George, because uh, he was with this other uh, production team. Uh, she wasn't there. I actually didn't meet her until maybe the third time I got him to do an event with with the other. She's that she came, and that's when I finally met her. I think she was in Illinois, Rockford, Illinois, or something at that time. So I didn't meet her for a few few months months actually. Uh, but yeah, you know, and yeah, it was it was definitely an on and go on on again off again relationship. Yeah, but, yeah they had a lot of on and on and off. Off. Yeah, like like even when George moved here, he was away from her, and uh, he was in San Diego, and she went back home like three or four months earlier. And then George was getting out of the house and needed to move somewhere. So when he moved into my house here, she actually came from Rockford over, and that's when they reconnected again. He always went back to her. Yeah, trust me. I said there was a lot. Well, and then she said, obviously, that, yeah. And she was there. What's that? I'm sorry. No, I'm saying, and, and as you said, and she ultimately was there in the, uh, yeah, you know, toward the end and in, in offering up that kind of support connection and that kind of deep. Uh, she told me he passed away. Deep time. She told ahead, me that Bobby. he passed away with his head. What's that? No, go ahead, please. She passed. She told- yeah, she told me he passed away with his head in, in, on her chest, and he was she was holding his hand, and that's how he passed away. So, you know, he was with her, so he was with someone he loved. And everything. That's and intense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what a, we should all be so lucky. Of course, yeah. Of course, I know that he'd prefer to hold your hand while he was passing, but you weren't there. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. I would have been there for him. I would have let him put his head on my chest too. But you know. <laughs> I think George, George and Rhonda didn't really want people to know yeah, towards the end, only when it got really close. You know. so that's why a lot of people didn't know that he was how how, how close he was until yeah. I mean, a lot a lot of people didn't know that over, almost two years ago, a doctor told him if right. he keeps drinking, he'll be gone. It's- Maybe 12 months. Well, he made it over 20 months drinking, still drinking. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> he, he never slowed out down. He to go. No, George is George. He, he pretended did. like he did a couple times, but he did it. He lived his life his way, plain and simple. Yes. You know, he he lived his life that he can the way he wanted to. You know, not too many people can say that. Not too many people in this world can say, I did it my way. Other than Frank, so oh, yeah. other than Frank, but I, I, which I'm sure he met Frank somewhere. I think so. I'm sure he 
I'm sure he partied with Frank and all them guys back in the day. I mean, he did a lot of fun things. He had adventurous life. I, I wish he was still here because they were working on another TV thing with him, actually. And he wanted me to be involved. I just yep. because I enjoyed his stories. Yep. Yeah, for the short time I hung out with him, was oh, many. Yeah, he, Go ahead, he always talked about the one that got away, which was which was Stevie Nicks. Like, oh yeah, he had a big crush yeah. on her. I was just about ready to bring that up. That's one yeah, of the ones, one of the stories he told me. <laughs> yeah, and he and he thought Bob Dylan he was a that. walking god. Yeah. That was yeah. the other thing. Well, I was actually, thinking. until he met him, though. Telling right, no, no, right, 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 right. But he thought him. he thought Bob Dylan was the greatest songster, lyricist of all time. If 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 uh, if you were in control of the music and somehow George figured out that you were in control of the music, he would instruct you to put on some Bob Dylan. And uh, that was his go to. He, he uh, and he was real knowledgeable, so he knew all the music classics. He knew oh, everybody. He knew everything. everything. So, you know, at one point, there was some discussion of him getting behind uh, some branding in the cannabis industry. Is there anything like that with the that was ever, like, underway or anything like that that could still possibly come of the market that was put in place? To my knowledge, there are no deals that were signed. Right. But those guys are frozen, I guess. But I mean, there was a lot of discussion like that, but nothing ever, nothing ever made. No, it. okay, no. But no, there no, are no. very few recognizable names in the industry, you know, carrying over. His is one of those that that carried some cachet with those that knew it, and those that. And again, <clears throat> the involvement of the motion picture industry is what takes a guy like. <clears throat> Boston George's original status and, and it elevates him to the man that we knew. I wish there was someone out there at Hollywood that would make a John Sinclair film that would elevate him to that status, the status he deserves uh, prior, you know, while he's still around well, to see it. The, the problem with that uh, becomes yeah. that they get a hold of it and they change the story. And, um, you know, even that blow story, um, it's just bits and pieces. Anybody that spent any time with George once you asked all the questions you had related to the movie, he would talk to you for hours about things that you never thought to ask about because you didn't see it in the movie, you know? I mean, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. When you can think with the, with the White Panthers and, and the early days of rock and roll in Detroit, and then, you know, incarceration and all the challenge. Yeah. There we go.